Have you ever had things break in production and you're not quite sure what went wrong? I remember the good old days when you had to go use things like tail and grep and then randomly click around the app to try and figure out what broke. <laughs> you don't have to do that anymore, thank heaven. All you have to do is go sign up for Airbrake and then install it in your app. Airbrake is really simple. You get a little code that you put into your config file and then you just install the gem. That's it. Really simple to set up. Then what it does is it aggregates all of the exceptions and errors that are thrown by your application so that you don't have to keep track of that anymore. It collects other information from the system as the errors occur, so parameters and things like that, depending on where the error occurs. And one thing that drove me crazy when we first started getting apps like Airbrake doing this work is that you would get 10,000 of the same error and that doesn't happen anymore. Now they just aggregate it all together. You can go look at the individual errors and see where and what actually happened. But when it comes right down to it, they just let you know, hey, this error occurred 10,000 times and then you go look at the individual ones so you can get them fixed. It's really easy to install. I already said that, but I just can't stress that enough. <laughs> you take two seconds, you get it installed and then you're off to the races. When I'm running a business, that time that it saves me is huge. So go check them out at airbreak.io slash rubyrogues, and that'll let them know that we sent you. But seriously, just make your life easier. If you go check it out at airbreak.io slash rubyrogues, you'll get Airbreak free for 30 days, plus get 50% off the first three months on the startup plan. So go check them out. You can thank me later. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Brian Hogan. Hello, everyone. Dave Kimura. Hey, everybody. Eric Berry. Hey. David Richards. Hello. <laughs> I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. And this week we're doing something a little bit different. We just, uh, I think all of us tweeted out that we're uh, doing kind of a live question setup thingy. So anyway, we'll see how this goes. But uh, yeah, we, before we get anyone joining, um, I guess we can start the conversation by having somebody... Uh, talk about vendoring their uh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a rant before the show, uh, right, Brian? Yeah, yeah. So I, I ran into a wonderful situation where you know, I, I can't really blame the, uh, blame the past developer because it just happens way too often. But I, have, I inherited some code and there was a Ruby gem that uh, no longer exists. It had been yanked and uh, a few years ago, the decision was made that all yanked gems would then be removed entirely so it could no longer be installed. The replacement gem that I needed was not compatible. It was completely different from what I needed. And it's just this sort of got me just thinking again that it is, in my opinion, incredibly important to just Vendor all your stuff. Everything that you, everything you depend on that comes from an external resource, you should probably have it in your code repository. And this is one of those, uh, you know, heresy things. Like, you, you know, you don't check in your your node modules folder to your repository, for example, because that just becomes a nightmare. But I'm thinking, stuff gets removed from these external repositories all the time. Stuff you might depend on. Sometimes upgrading to the next the next version of something just doesn't work. Uh, it's not compatible with many of the other dependencies. So having a frozen version of your code seems like a ridiculously good idea from my uh, point of view because I've been burned by this so many times. Um, so so this, this sort of started a very angry uh, angry Sunday for me as I tried to resolve these issues and track down a gem that didn't exist anymore. So Brian, I'm going to just give one rebuttal point. What happens if there's a merge conflict with one of those, with one of the node modules or something? you're definitely not an expert like you as a one is definitely not an expert on that module. That's why you're using it because you know, you're relying on someone else's expertise, but then how do you go about resolving that kind of conflict? It sounds like it could potentially add some unnecessary headaches. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I have been fortunate enough to not have to run into that situation because I'm not, uh, I'm not in a situation where I'm, um, you know, Constantly, constantly, constantly updating, updating, updating. Uh, when stuff works, it works, and then I monitor for security updates. But I look at that and go, "What's the worst case scenario if that happens? I can blow away the node modules folder and try and restore everything again because I've got a version. I got a version control history, right? I can go back and I can unscrew that up. But if the things that I need are no longer around anymore, I'm completely out of luck. So that's kind of how I've looked at it. Like if I've got a dependency problem. Um, you know, at least I have the code currently that works. 
uh, and I can redeploy that somewhere else. If, if an upgrade path might be at work, but if those things are still out there, sure, I can blow everything away and I can reinstall them. But I, I want some kind of a backup mechanism so that I have everything I need to redeploy my application. Yeah, and for my solution to that, at least for Ruby Gems, is to run my own gem in a box where all of my repositories are connected to that gem in a box instead of rubygems.org. So it'll download from Ruby Gems any gems that are missing from my private uh, repository or pool of gems. Uh, does something like that exist for node modules? I have no idea. Not that I'm aware of. Not heard of that. That would be a good curious. idea. There's so many dependencies yeah. in Node. Yeah. You know, to make that for efficiency. I am curious though, uh, Dave, with your setup, because, you know, for one, you know, I hear I hear Brian and you know his concerns there. But uh yeah, if you if you get a merge conflict, it also occurs to me that you don't have to blow away just the node modules folder. You can go in and just blow away that package and reinstall it. Yeah. Um and npm install will overwrite it anyway with whatever's the latest. So you can just NPM update your stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the the thing that I'm curious, Dave, is um, the, the issue that Brian ran into was that we, he had a package disappear on him or a gem disappear on him. And so what I'm wondering about is, um, do you have to manually add each gem to your gem in a box? Or is there some mechanism for saying, these are the gems that I depend on and so if I can't find it on my gem in a box, it, it'll pull it into my app, which is what you said, but also put it on the gem in a box so that it won't ever disappear again. Yeah. So it, you don't have to do any kind of management with it. It'll look at your gem file. It'll run through and install the gems like it normally would. And it's trying to pull from the source of your gem in a box server. If that gem in a box server doesn't have that particular version, or if you do a bundle update, then it's going to fall back to Ruby gems to download the original pristine gem and then have a stored copy of it within your gem in a box environment. So it's something where you set up one time and then kind of forget about other than general server maintenance. And then it just kind of magically works from there on out. Just in your gem file, you would reference your gem in a box server instead of rubygems.org. You know, I, I, I definitely had that problem um, with, <laughs> I didn't vendor. <laughs> so that was my first problem. And, and second, the, 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 the dependencies did disappear. And, um, and I had an, an immense amount of effort trying to get around it. But the third issue that I, I've blamed myself on when I've, you know, cause I've, I've created this problem in multiple platforms, multiple languages. So I had to learn someday, but, but, Part of it too for me is that my dependencies get sometimes I get so irresponsible for you know allowing myself to bring anything into the system that I don't understand all of it. And so now it's really hard to maintain or what do I need or what you know, I, I I've let it get away from me. So that's the other problem that I've and I and I think all three of those are are my fault, but but I think that's a fascinating. Um anyway, that's been my fault. Yeah. It actually is. is that there's a there's a something something a teacher told me at one point. You, you're going to save time now, but you're going to pay for it later. You know, you never actually save time. You just shift time. The, you know, if you a shortcut here, you end up making up for it somewhere else. And um, that, that's sometimes the case with dependencies. It, it, you bring up a really good point, right? You don't know all the code in your application at some point, right? And yet, you're ultimately responsible for it. It's in your application. It's in your code base. When it doesn't work, what can you tell? What can you tell your 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 customer or your clients, or whatever? Uh, some third party module that I need doesn't exist anymore, or whatever. I mean, you can't really. That's not an excuse that you can fall back on. Um, and 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 it's really works. I can't write all the code that I need to make an app. I need dependencies. Um, how do you how do you draw that line? You know, this is gonna be a, well. I don't have the answer, but. <laughs> But I do, I do like the idea of um, uh, simple over easy. You know, that was the uh, the closure uh, guy's uh, idea of you know understanding. You know, do the hard work up front that you can understand it, and then it it's um, it's understand. You know, it, it's harder maybe to get it all organized and architected in a way that you like it later. You know, if you can, you know, if you if you if you're just delaying the the, the work by grabbing dependencies, you know, don't delegate that understanding. Take some time to at least say, all right, well, this is supposed to do this and this and this, and this is my 
my clear interface. And I don't know all the internals, but at the very least, if I couldn't do that, I'd have to, to replace this interface this way. Maybe that's a, a step in the right direction. I'm saying not from practice, but guessing that, you know, when I keep telling myself, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> I, <got, laughs> I tell myself yeah. those kinds of things. I, I, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. I, I know like for myself, I, I got really paranoid for a while, for several years, I got really paranoid with stuff changing so rapidly that I went a little bit, I went a little bit farther than I probably should have and made abstractions for all the things that I brought in just so that I could swap them out easier. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that was the best approach, but it certainly made me feel good at the time. You know, I, I've done that a lot too. Maybe we all have. I've definitely done that. I put very clear interfaces in so I can swap them. Then I never swap them. <laughs> but I exactly I'm not gonna have to. <laughs> you know, there was a, a tweet I saw this morning about the uh, stages of of a system. You know, first, um, you know, well, I'm, I'm going to get to it later. And and second, uh, why was that even in there in the first place? And the third stage is, I don't remember why it was there. I better not touch it. <laughs> so things just kind of the inertia just nice. <laughs> yeah. At some point, it's just too scary. I don't understand it. It's, it's, it's going to stay. <laughs> it's like, remember, remember that, remember that, that, that two week period in your software development career where you understood a system entirely in your head because you weren't working on systems that were so complicated just yet? Is that, that, that moment when you, well, you were a newbie, so you didn't understand hardly anything. Then you finally got to the point where you wrote, you had a whole, a whole app or whatever. It was all in your head for about two weeks. And then things got really complicated again. Remember that those fleeting two weeks of your <laughs> software development life when you could understand an entire system all in your head? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it even lasted two weeks. <laughs> yeah, but then I wrote my fifth line of code and, and yeah. <laughs> it was all out the window. All of a sudden, it wasn't a whole world anymore. It was something else and I'm out of my depth. <laughs> Now it's a to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you only write those when you invent a new JavaScript framework. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, just take the hello world and to-do list thing. And that kind of shows how complicated things have gotten over the past several years. Like before, any kind of programming book you would pick up, you would learn that language by first writing a hello world application. Now, you can't get away with that. Like, even in a Rails application, a Rails application, Elixir, Phoenix app, or any kind of JavaScript framework, you're not going to write a Hello World. You're going to write a to-do list yeah. because Hello World is just way too simple. You need something a bit more complicated to actually see what this language or framework is doing. Yeah, I mean, Rails Rail sort, of, sort of came out with, it wasn't, it wasn't Hello World, it was build a blog, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then kind of everybody kind of followed that, and then the, the to do JS started. But I mean, it used to be hard to write a Hello World program, like you know, comparatively. Now it's one line of Python or one line of Ruby or you know, a, a one line of JavaScript. Um, or but, but if you're girl. well, if you're if you're the if you're like a brand new like first semester software development student, writing Hello World in Java is it's not it, it's you know, from a programming standpoint not complex, but there's a lot of stuff to unpack in the public void main and the, the class and all that kind of stuff. A lot of, lot of things to unpack there. Um, with, with, you know, system.println, hello world, or puts, put us hello world, not a lot to talk about. So in order to flex the muscles of the systems, you got to write more complex stuff. It, it sort of speaks to the fact that we're, we're, building, we're building more powerful frameworks and languages so we can focus on more complex problems, I think. I like that. Yeah. I'm really disappointed in your uh, con the lack of confidence you have that I can actually complicate Hello World. Because, man, <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear, I, I, I'll write stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, I get started and I'm like, oh, this is going to be so simple. And then, yeah, a, a couple hours later, I'm like, this is the most convoluted, tangled up mess that I have oh. ever touched. <laughs> well, go, go write Hello World in Elm. <laughs> it's it's like surprisingly more than you think you'd have to do. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been thinking for a while about this. Um, so I was a when I was in the seventies when I was a boy. My dad uh, 
bought a little inside computer that he had to solder together himself and it had the little switches in the front. There was a there was one of those in war games, right? And <laughs> and I wanted to be with my dad and he was literally spent a year doing that before he even knew there was an assembler. Um, and so he's doing bits and bytes only in registry. And I wanted to do what he was doing. And I like, when he wasn't looking, I would flip the switch so I could program too. <laughs> and he spent hours trying to figure out what that is, you know? And, and so we get to these higher, higher level of abstractions that are supposed to make it easier, right? That your little boy wouldn't walk in and flip a switch. And now you've got to spend six hours rebuilding everything. But, um, but just the idea that, yeah, that complexity is really hard. Um, I spend a lot of time now in, in TensorFlow and doing deep learning and, you know, I'm programming a system to program the computer. <laughs> I don't even know what it's doing or why it's doing or if it's going to be right. And I don't even have a, a very good idea if, if it goes wrong, then I would even know it. It's kind of scary. I've got to get smarter than I am. Okay. We just get high level abstractions. I think sometimes. So, so everybody at this point remembers David Richards is the one responsible for Skynet. He's the one. <laughs> when, <laughs> when the robot uprising happens. <laughs> it happens. Uh, I'll yeah. be somewhere hopefully far away from the guns and the, the, the pitchforks. <laughs> That's okay. They'll send somebody back in time to Father John. What's his name? Yeah. <laughs> Stop <Father>. that, man. <laughs> well, at least it's not flipping a single switch, though. You know, the complexity. Yeah. These platforms. And I love them. I think I think we all love them. It's just hard because the dependencies, and it's hard because the trust. You know, we get this um, in in the fictional world that uh, they talk about this meta thinking, and the idea is that there's a lot of parts of life that we just do together, and we just get that it's done, like currency and driving on the same side of the road. You know, things that we trust that just we know everybody else is going to do. But the more civilized we are, the more advanced we get, the more that trust is and if we're building a platform or using a system that's got a lot of convention a lot of dependency there's an incredible amount of work that we have to do to try to say so yeah that's that's a solid system which is why we need to vendor our our, our systems we got to make sure well i've at least got it at this point in time and i can put it on a uh, what's it called dave your system uh gem in a box yeah or yeah. bringing it into the to the, the repo and bring it local so that i've got it somehow yeah, I mean, you're not, you know, nothing else. Just, you know, clone the GitHub repositories that contain the versions of the code that you need. So when someone deletes them, you've got them. You know, whatever whatever floats your boat. You know, maybe checking everything into the, you know, the Git repo isn't the best way to do it. But um, I've done a lot of things wrong, and I've done a lot of things right. And the only way I figure that out is by doing them and then deciding whether they're right or wrong. Uh, and with this particular problem, I... I just I get a little sad now and then when I'm writing code because I I just there's there's it's it's not necessarily an intentional thing that happens but I just wish that people who wrote software libraries had a little more empathy towards the people who are using them who aren't keeping their applications on the bleeding edge all the time it's it's not necessarily something not necessarily something that everybody can just constantly keep their gems up to date and their node modules up to date to the latest versions it's not always possible I mean. I just learned today that, that GitHub finally got their Rails application to Rails 4.2. It's, it's like, you know, you know, that's that's great and all, but you know, I'm willing to bet you that in that I don't know anything about this, but I'm willing to bet you that in their journey, there were probably some gem compatibility issues that didn't work because this gem couldn't be updated until that one was updated. And that one and and oh, you shouldn't have waited so long because now everything's out of date. And we just never bothered to make a version of that gem that will work with that particular version of this other gem because we moved on. And I just kind of get a little sad when I think about the fact that there's not a lot of empathy if you're putting the library out there. Uh, I try to have a little more a little more patience and empathy for people who may not be moving as fast as you. Well, especially if you're not in active development on a system, we I mean, just think about how rarely people will touch it once it's kind of baked in and the features are there. There, there's just nobody. There's no mind, you know, mind share to borrow from. Nobody's actually thinking about it actively. It's just sitting there making money, hopefully. <laughs> you know, so to try to bring those things up is really tough. When I was, yeah, well, and thank goodness for Google, because when I was looking for, when I was looking to figure out what the hell was going wrong with the app I was working on on, on Sunday, it was like going back in time, learning about all these issues in Rails that happened four years ago and uh, you know, 
thankfully some people took notes and had the same error message as I had because otherwise I never would have figured it out. Now imagine if you're working on something even more bleeding edge and less popular, how difficult that can be. You know, yeah. three years from now, can you find the answer to that obscure error message you're getting in an app because a certain gem no longer exists and you can't find out why? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting too because even, I mean, think about when you're writing code, how many times have, have we all written code and we put a log message that says this should never happen, <laughs> you know? And then it does, we'll see at some point. Like, okay, so so something about the my assumptions of the world are different. And that's just in the code logic, you know, the, the dependency stuff and the system, the whole platform, you know, there's just a lot more risk, I think, of things going weird that you've got to just prepare for the thing that you can't see, you know, like, you know, like let's bring it here or realize that, you know, not everybody's actively working like I am on, on the thing right now. I mean, yeah, exactly. A lot of people think I'm super paranoid because I, you know, there are certain, there are certain things that I will not, uh, you know, I, I won't not vendor my stuff anymore. I just won't, it's just a non-starter for me because I've been bitten by it too many times. You know, another thing that I won't do that some people kind of like think is weird is I still use, I still use Capistrano 2 for a lot of my apps because Cap2 has a local deployment. I don't need a, I don't need GitHub or I don't need an external Git repository to deploy my app. I can just, at, at last resort, deploy from a local folder. Um, and, and, you know, that to me is important because there have been enough times where I've been stuck deploying. I mean, yes, GitHub doesn't go down that often, but there's been enough times where, unfortunately, I've had to deploy something and I couldn't because of a network error or a dependency issue or something like that. So there's these little things that over the years I've learned that seem like a little they seem a little bit little little extreme, but they save my butt more often than I'd like to admit, and that makes me again a little sad that 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 happens. You know, and I I've noticed that in in systems I've built before where uh, we've got a lot of developers, and something does happen with GitHub, and all of a sudden we're all walking around the office, everything stopped because something critical couldn't be done. <laughs> We've had that a couple times in the last few years where, uh, wait a minute, uh, GitHub slower down and um, we didn't build it right. We, we're kind of stuck. We've got to do some platform things and we're all going to just kind of talk about how we're never going to do this again. <laughs> but it's happened more than once. So it's, it's interesting at the end of this conversation. Well, it's, it's interesting. You, David. It doesn't yeah. happen to anybody else. <laughs> 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 it's it's an, it's really interesting that we've taken a decentralized version control system and made it centralized. It's right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and, and it's interesting to me as well. Um, I was thinking of this image. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, it's it's a I saw on Twitter. It's a full stack developer, and what it is is this beautiful back end of a horse. It's just like shaded and looks gorgeous. And then the front end of the horse looks like it was drawn by a three-year-old. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> yeah, we've got this limited knowledge. And so, like, there's things we just won't do or don't do. We don't think about platform. We don't think about DevOps. We don't think about, you know, non-centralized repositories. Or, or what do I do if I'm not just going to clone, push, and pull on my regular, you know, merge request? You know, you know, I, I treat Git uh, or I treat Git like it's a, uh, what what's the old ones? I can't even remember the old ones. Anymore. Subversion, subversion, or yeah, CVS, CVS. Yes, is what I couldn't remember. <laughs> yeah, and some of our younger listeners are going to be like, "Isn't that the pharmacy?" Yeah, <laughs> it, it is absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and thank heaven that you you don't know this. <laughs> yes, the the concept of having to lock files so you can check them out and then nobody else can look at them it was just weird. <laughs> Yeah, but walk, walking across the office, and, are you working on that file actively? Oh no, I forgot. Let me push that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now I can do my work. <laughs> but but it's interesting too. I mean, we're talking about the things that we we assume that just don't quite conform. You know, we assume that the gem will be there forever. You know, we we assume that uh, the the deployment process this way or that way will just always work. You know, uh, Brian talking about using Capistrano too. We just assume that we'll always be able to deploy, you know, in an automated fashion by having it tar up what's on my machine and push it to the other one. And yeah, all of this changes. And sometimes the things that change are the things that we kind of rely on as an assumption. And it's, it's, an, it's an assumption that's so deep-seated 
that granted that is true until it's not true anymore. And that's when it hurts. That's true. It's sort of, it's sort of like that, that, that kind of a gut check feeling of, oh, everything I thought about now, there's this thing I completely got blindsided by or whatever. And then when that happens enough, that sticks with you. Just, just mm-hmm. like the assumption, now the opposite assumption. And it's like, oh, you know, the, the, the paranoia sets in, you know. Um, what, what happens if, what happens if, what happens if? Um, and so that's why, that's why I, I, can, I continually try to beat this soft drumbeat of empathy for other developers, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, being the maintainer of these projects isn't always a picnic either, right? No, trust me. I know. I've got. So, I've got one. Yeah, I've got one that I maintain for in in Node. That's it. it it's the sort of the same kind of issues. Like I had to deprecate something, and you know, but the thought the thought about how we we're going to deprecate it, and when we we're going to deprecate it, that discussion was was crazy. And you're going to hurt somebody, but at least I didn't take the old version down and delete it forever. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but I, I've just been on the other side of that where, like, I have a gem out there that connects to Project Honeypot. And it basically will just identify uh, bad actors by IP addresses, the way that it works. But, I mean, I wrote that, like, seven years ago, and I haven't really looked at it since. And so, you know, how much how much responsibility do I have for that versus, you know, maybe somebody else just going and forking it? I remember the 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 way I became in charge of the node library that I maintain was that I sent a PR in and the person said, "You own this now. Have fun." That that was literally <laughs> how it happened. How it happened. I don't want to make this anymore. You seem interested. Here you go. Tag um, you're it. <laughs> I, that was literally that was literally what it was. It was tag you're it. Um, and you know, there's nothing uh, nothing really wrong with that. I mean, I, I think it's perfectly. I think it's great to walk away from stuff you're no longer interested in doing. I really do. I mean, if if this thing isn't 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 exciting to you anymore, that's cool. But you know, don't just let it sit there on GitHub and, and you know at least put a deprecation notice on the README file saying, "Don't use yeah. this anymore. I'm not maintaining this." Um, or go here and use this other thing instead. Um, but you know, maybe if you don't want to maintain something anymore, shop around for someone who does. Uh, I don't recommend a tag your it game because that's not fun. Um, but you know, again, empathy for other people. Just tell them if you know, if you're not maintaining it and it's not actively used anymore, let people know. Don't make them, uh, you know, fish through uh, fish through a hundred messages and GitHub issues and say, "Is this maintained anymore?" Well, that's, <laughs> it's it brings up the reason why um, Ruby Toolbox was so valuable. And I know it went through a down period. I think it's actually back up. But if you're anything like me, anytime you would choose any library that you wanted to use in the Ruby world, you'd always go to Ruby Toolbox and make sure that you pick the right one that's the most actively maintained, that has the most stars, the most usage, the most downloads. Because then that, that gives you that sense of trust for that library. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times those libraries do decide, well, we're no longer going to maintain and they still appear at the top of the list because maybe they had the most recent commit or whatever. But um, yeah, tools like that really help you make proper decisions when it comes to which libraries to use. But I, I'm also on the on the team of if you're not, you know, open source is such a personal thing to to contribute to, to build. And there is that burnout cycle or that cycle of where they go through uh, the phase of excitement and getting it out there to becoming a, a basically a full time or a part time maintainer to all of a sudden they have an issues, you know, over a thousand or a hundred issues and they just can't keep up. And that motivation very much goes away because the developer often is no longer even using it. Um, I think it goes from a point where it, it's most valuable to the developer to it's actually very low value to the developer and more valuable to the open source community. Um, but I've, I've seen a lot of people do that. I've actually t- uh, taken over maintenance of, of gems before. And oftentimes I see like looking for a new maintainer or those comments like what you're saying is like, and no, don't use this. Go over there and use that. When you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks, and VPNs. 
Plus, they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like Backups, Node Balancer, and Longview to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files, and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code RubyRogues2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code again is RubyRogues2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com slash careers to see their available positions. Well, just don't delete it. Just don't delete it. Don't delete Please. it. <laughs> Please don't delete it. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I'm going to change the topic just a little bit. Brian, you had gems disappear on you. Were you working in an older version of Ruby or Rails? Or yeah, this, yeah. this specific one, this specific thing. Uh, I can't talk too much about what it is, but it needed a very specific version of Ruby um, right. in, in, order, in order to continue to run. Yeah, and the reason that I ask is because generally that's where I see these problems to rise is, oh, I'm on an older version of such and such a thing. And, you know, and then they, that that's where things disappear or, you know, well, what do I use for this back, you know, back five years ago or whatever, depending on what version you're on. Right. Like, and the, the, the upgrade path can be really tricky. Like if you've got a, if you have like a, a Rails 3 application right now that because that you've inherited and you want to move it to Rails 5, that's sometimes impossible depending on the gem choices that someone's made. Yeah. I, 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 took, I took an application a couple of years ago from Rails 1 to Rails 4 in about 20 minutes. Um, but that's because it had no gems. It had, it had no dependencies other than active record and the built-in stuff. The people who built the app just used everything that was just baked into Rails, no external anything. Uh, and the upgrade was the upgrade was the, the upgrade was perfect. You know, the tests needed little minor modifications that were easy enough to script, and um, and it, that was about it. It was it was fantastic. But other ones, I've I've I have an application I'm still trying to get upgraded because it's like going back in the time machine and finding out. Well, in order to get to this, you need the latest. You need, you need the last version of R spec two because that will tell you all the things you have to change when you go to R spec three. And oh no, this other thing that somebody added to the application doesn't work with that latest version of R spec because reasons. Um, and 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 it's sort of like it's got me thinking like you almost just like need to dedicate time every couple of months to just upgrading your stuff constantly. And does you know do a lot of dev teams have time to do that when they're trying to push out new features? I don't know. Well, yeah, and the the complexity, uh, you know, when you've got to do a multi-stage, <clears throat> excuse me, a multi-stage uh, upgrade like that, where you bring it to, let's say, R spec two, and then let it sit and test it and figure it out, and then, you know, that's a milestone, and then you got to do it. That's you know, that's an exponential, exponentially, exponentially more effort if you have to go through there. So if there was some sane way, maybe with that or containerization, or I mean. There's got to be ways of, of getting that work into the regular workflow so that people can see it, test it, know that it's going to be good when we go there, even if it's not in production yet. Um, one th yeah, one, one thing I've been experimenting with with Rails, just I've been just started thinking about all the things in the last couple of years. You know, what do we know about software development? Well, what do we know? What we really know is we should stop lashing our applications to our frameworks. We, we kind of know this, but we, do, we just don't because it's too easy. But I was thinking like, you know, now... I'm architecting my Rails applications so that the upgrade process is me building a new Rails application and then moving my files into it. Because I think that's just going to, just my, given my history of working with Rails, that's just going to be easier for me in the long run than trying to figure out, oh, which internal Rails files I have to upgrade. If I can keep my models and, and my business logic in, in components that are decoupled from the framework, in theory, I should be able to generate a new Rails 6 app when it comes out and copy the files into it, and things should just work, right? I mean, in theory. Um, now, I don't have any applications that I currently work on that I can do that with because they are all very tightly coupled to the framework, and that's my fault. Um, but you know, I'm I'm actively exploring ways to make the upgrade process easier because this is a nightmare and, uh, for a couple of these things that have that, I, that I've inherited. Well, I like that idea that you know, what can you actually depend on? You know, it, it almost feels like Seneca and Stoicism, you know, and like you can't really count on tomorrow. So what are you going to do today? You know, you can't really count on, you know, Rails 4, 5, 6, 7 to being what it was. So, you know, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to decouple it. You know, you can't really depend on the dependency being around. So you're going to find a way to keep it around 
when you're using it. So I, I guess just being willing <laughs> to say that, hey, you know, really realistically, I can't. All these things that I think are good, probably take a look. Well, I've been really inspired by the work that the Phoenix uh, framework people have been doing. I, I, I've been really inspired by that because when when the first versions of Phoenix came out, they they were pretty much you know very much like Rails, very tied to the framework. But if you look at the one point three, um, they're really encouraging that you you have your app and then you have your web app, and and they're they're really encouraging this decoupling. And I I, I think that a, a lot if, if you know if, if you're a Ruby developer, if you're a Rails developer, um, and you haven't looked at what Phoenix is doing, there's some inspiration you might be able to steal and borrow. So even if you don't use Elixir and, and Phoenix for your day to day work, it might not be a bad idea to look at some of the patterns that they're trying to encourage uh, in that framework. And maybe there's some stuff we can steal and borrow. You know, and I, I, I'm I've been building a, a Phoenix app for the last year and a half. And uh, we've got about 15 apps in there. We've got our web app and a lot of other apps. And it just encourages a way of, of building internal interfaces and thinking, you know, decoupling pieces, you know, understanding, you know, how the data is really supposed to work. And, and, and ideally, there's a lot of other reasons to do it. But mentally, it's a, it's a good practice of just saying, yeah, okay, that's a different thing. Let's think about it differently. What does it need? What's its real dependencies? You know, and, and it's a different, you know, it, we all kind of stopped when they came out with 1.3 and they said, okay, we've got this umbrella app. And so what you have is you have this, this overall app that's going to contain apps in it, like the web app and the core app. And then we stood back for a day or two and said, wait a minute, how does that change our thinking? And it, we realized, ooh, we didn't even realize how much we were coupling. We thought we were doing something beautiful and clean. Like, oh yeah, that it's easy to make the mistake of, of just coupling things because we've got to get that delivered now, you know, that kind of a thing. Somebody should start a show on Elixir. Just saying. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, actually, let's, <laughs> let's announce that uh, because it's probably going to be coming out soon. So yeah, yeah uh, Chuck, you want to announce that? Sure. So um, I had been planning on uh, starting a show on Elixir for a while and I just never quite got around to it. And uh, Eric uh, finally just said, hey, we should do a show on Elixir. So um, I already had the artwork done, the domain name purchased and everything. I just hadn't pulled the trigger. So uh, we're recording our first episode next week. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, it'll probably be just an introduction, get to know the panelists a little bit, see how that goes. But yeah, um, it's Elixir Mix is what we decided to call it or what I decided to call it when I bought the domain and got the artwork done. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's at elixirmix.com and uh, you can go and subscribe over there. Um, I should, in fact, by the time this goes out, I'll make sure that I have the RSS feed up. There won't be anything in it or there might be just like one little file in it that says, hi, coming soon. But um, anyway, that way people can subscribe and I can submit it to iTunes and things like that. And uh, yeah, then we'll start releasing shows over there. Um, but uh, yeah, our panelists, we have um, Eric and I are going to be on the show and then Josh Adams from Elixir Sips, um, is going to be on the show and Mark Erickson. And I'm not sure what his background is. Eric, do you want to? Uh, he's been doing, he's just been a, uh, an Elixir developer for quite a while. And he's also building a course on Elixir and Phoenix. So he's, he's an educator, extremely uh, gifted developer, and he makes the most amazing looking salads he never shared with me but man they're they're good looking salads dork you should share. <laughs> whenever uh, mark uh, mark and i work uh, about three feet from each other and uh whenever he speaks about elixir or architecture or how it goes it's just like i just quietly listen he's a great great thinker very very organized and, and explains things well yeah well and i think eric is really complaining he should vendor his salads so that uh, Eric can <laughs> enjoy them over and over and over. Vendor everything. Yeah, they keep Vendor everything. The salads keep disappearing. I want them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, okay, weird thought went through my head. Anyway, um, and then Eric, you just lined somebody else up and I 
don't know if I actually saw two, the name, Yes, two people. Um, so one of them is Justin Bean, who is a developer that I've been working with. He's got about two years Elixir experience, extremely talented guy who really understands OTP, really understands channels, really understands like some of the unique properties of Phoenix and Elixir. Um, and so, and it's, and as you probably know, I've been building um, code, code sponsor, which has been renamed to code fund. I've been building code fund a hundred percent in Elixir and Phoenix and it's open source. So that's kind of fun. Um, and then the final guy who is just this, magician of elixir is uh his name is cody pole um i've worked with him quite a bit in the past he is just a very 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 talented developer um he's one of those guys that reminds me of you brian hogan and david richards and 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 a lot of you actually where is just a very technically minded deep thinking individual who uh has earned his opinions so anyway, I'm I'm excited to uh, to be on this show. I'm an elixir noob, so <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be the dumb guy asking all the questions, and <laughs> everybody else will be able to you. provide answers. So yeah, awesome. awesome. And one other thing, uh, just if you're interested in the show, I've been adding uh, user voice forums to each of the shows, and that's where you can go and suggest a topic, a guest, or you can just upvote or downvote the suggestions there. So since it's a new show, I would love to see what people want to hear about. I mean, we, we as panelists usually have a pretty good feel for what we're going through, but sometimes there are blind spots and it really helps if you just go in and say, Hey, this is what I want to hear about. So um, go over to elixirmix.com. Um, I'll make sure that that link is there too. And um, yeah, just click the suggest a topic um, button or link. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to hearing what you all want to hear about. Love it. Very excited for this show. Very cool. Yep. Well, it got quiet all of a sudden. Because <laughs> everybody's regretting Ruby. Like, I wish I was working on Elixir. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be perfectly honest. I like using them both together. It's very cool. Really? Oh, really? How, does that, how does that work? Uh, do tell, sir. Well, uh, Elixir for Elixir for backend stuff and you know, <laughs> ra- Rails Rails for my database stuff. I, I I still I still am on that. I'm still on the on the side of things. I don't like how Ecto does database stuff. I just don't like it. Um, it they may be right, like they may be like philosophically correct about how they want you to do database stuff. I just don't like it. Um, and and that's that's just me being curmudgeon-y. Uh But what I've figured out is that you know with 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 Rails, you can. I've mentioned this a couple times before, but they're um, the, the long and short of it is that with, with you can serialize the, the the devised tokens in a Rails application with JSON, and then there are plugs in uh, in Elixir that can then do you serialize them. So you can log in you can log in with to your Rails app with device, and then be logged in, in the Elixir application as well. Um, and so you can kind of unify things together. And it's been it's very been very interesting to use. Um, in my opinion, the best of both apps. You know, the best of the best of both worlds. I can do the the customer side facing stuff um, in, in Rails with the databases and the logins and and all these um, and the payment gateways and all the things that I've been using for years that are tried and true. And then I can take advantage of Phoenix channels and things like that uh, for um, all the real time stuff. And it's it's been kind of interesting to experiment with this and see how it works. So I don't I don't think you have to throw you know I don't think you have to dive into uh, Elixir and leave all your Ruby stuff behind. I'd love to see how you have that set up. I can try to find you some stuff. Maybe we should do a crossover episode, and Brian can be the host for or the guest on both. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, the crossover is this a crossover episode? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You guys, oh man, you watch, uh, what's that show called? Um, the horse show. Ah, uh, what's it called? Bojack Horseman. Bojack Horseman. And that dog man, he's like, is this a crossover episode? Like every single episode he's in. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good show. Man. So <laughs> All right. Well, anything else that we want to dive into? We didn't have, we had one person show up. And then I said, hey, do you have any questions? And then they left. So yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to plan this out better and like send out an email blast and things like that. Let people know that we're doing it next time we do it. Yeah. 
But we maybe we should just plan one of these like every quarter and just say, hey, you know, if you have a question or something you want to bring up on the show, then this is the date we're doing it. What are your thoughts on having just the odd, like the public able to hop in and ask questions via chat, like on every episode where we yeah. just say, hey, hop in and we're doing a live recording. Yeah, that's eventually where I wanted to get to. I would also like to start posting video. I mean, I would totally leave it up to the hosts as to whether or not they want their video shown, turn it off. And some videos I could see, you know, just show a name or a picture. But um, yeah, I, I've been working toward that. That's why I actually bought the webinar package that goes with Zoom is because then I could have, you know, 100 or 500 people or something right. join in. And so, yeah, that's, that's something that I'm looking at adding in. So I'll see if I can get the links up for that as well. Um, on the website so that if you want to watch live, you can actually uh, go look at the calendar for devchat.tv to see when the recordings are. And then um, you can go and follow the particular link for that show. Cool. It's kind of like, you know what you're doing here, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. I've gotten a whole lot more organized over the last little while. Um, I'm, I'm still working through some of the bits, but um, uh, the sponsorship and the, um, the content management has gotten a whole lot better. And uh, I've been building this Rails app that, uh, you know, maybe I should follow Eric's uh, example and go rebuild it in Elixir. You will not be, regret it. That will, that will be so much more work. But anyway, so I'm pretty happy with uh, where things are heading there. And yeah, we're adding new pieces to that all the time too. So the, the processes are getting more well-defined. I have um, one person working for me on... Uh, lining up guests and managing some of the content. And any, anyway, a lot of this stuff has just gotten a whole lot easier to, to reason about. So, yeah. And we're making plans. Beautiful. All right. Well, um, I think this is a good time to go to picks. So, Brian, do you want to start us off with picks? Hey, when it comes to health, you probably have some of the same disqualifications that I do. You sit all day. You run a busy life, and when you do make it to the gym, the only thing you're really qualified to do is turn the treadmill on. I was an athlete in high school, and so I could have thrown swimming in the mix, but that was about it. And I didn't really know what to do when I decided that I needed to get my health under control, especially since I have type 2 diabetes and I want to be around for my kids. So I contacted my friend JC over at DevLifts, and DevLifts, they did me a huge, huge, huge favor. Sure, it's a paid service, but what they did is they gave me a workout program, they also gave me some eating guidelines and they have a Slack room where I can go and I can ask questions and they give weekly challenges on things that I need to do differently. I really, really love it. So if you're looking for a way to get into shape, you're looking for a way to improve your health, then go check them out at devlifts.io. That's D-E-V-L-I-F-T-S dot I-O. Sure. Uh, one of the things that we just talked about during the during this one was was separating you know the app logic from the framework logic. And I want to plug a book called Functional Web Development with Elixir, OTP, and Phoenix. Now this is a Rails show or a Ruby show, but um, you, you can get some great ideas from this book. Um, this is a book by Lance Halverson uh, from the Pragmatic uh, Bookshelf, oh, yeah. and it um, it walks you through building the app itself first before you add the the web framework around it and so it gives you uh you get this really really good uh, solid idea about how that architecture might work and so you might be able to apply some of those lessons to you know your your programming language and framework of choice so that's my first pick um and and is lance an old ruby guy because i swear his name sounds really familiar i have no idea i can't speak okay. to that um, and my other pick is, um, it's a tiling window manager for the Mac that I'm absolutely in love with called chunk WM. And, uh, I, I have been wanting an actual true tiling window manager like XML and Adder i3 on the Mac for a while. And I've tried many different things. This is the first thing that actually works exactly how I want it to work. And, uh, there's a, a tutorial, uh, a very nicely written tutorial on how to get it started on the GitHub page for Chunk WM. But you know, a tiling window manager means I don't have to uh, guess where a new window is going to pop up. Um, when I get, what if I have a full screen web browser and I add a new window, they just get split halfway vertically down the screen, and, it, and windows just show up in a um, 
exactly partitioned where I want them to be. I don't have to worry about resizing them or moving them around so I can see things. Um, it's it's just a wonderful experience, and I, I couldn't be happier to have the same thing that I used to have on my Linux desktops on on my Mac. So those are my those are my picks: Chunk WM and this a wonderful book called Functional Web Development with Elixir, Elixir P, and Phoenix. Awesome, Dave. What are your picks? All right, so. My first pick is one that's going to be outdated by the time the show comes out, and that is Rails 5.2 was just released. So uh, Rails 5.2.0, I love working in Ruby. I love working with the Ruby on Rails framework. So I think it deserves my pick. And my second pick is a controversial one, and it is the GDPR. From an end user, if I were to live in Europe, I absolutely love the idea that at any point in time, I can request, hey, what kind of information do you have on me and how are you using it? But then also have the right to be forgotten to say, hey, I want you to purge all of my information and everything that you know about me like I did not exist. From a developer, I hate GDPR because it <laughs> includes so much complexity and how are you backing up? You know, your SQL dumps that you're doing, you know, how can you purge that data and stuff? So from a developer standpoint, I hate it. But from an end user standpoint, if I lived in Europe, then I think it would be amazing. Awesome. Yeah, we should probably do a show on GDPR and what it means. But Yeah. yeah. Uh, in my next Drift or Ruby episode, I actually plan on covering it and how to get ready for it. Because I think the deadline's May 20-something. 28th or something. It's really soon. Yep. All right, Eric, what are your picks? I've got a couple of picks, and I can't remember if I picked it last time. I recently went on a trip to uh, Florida. It was a lot of fun. I like flew a plane, and we went on a big boat ride, and we went to Universal Studios, which, by the way, is not worth it unless you have kids with you. And we went to like all these different places. It was a lot of fun, like a lot of fun. Um, but one of the best places that we went at that time was this place called Krabby Bills. Now, not not Krabby's. No, there's a place called Krabby Bills, which is in Clearwater, uh, Florida. And oh my gosh, this place was oh, it was sinfully wonderful and i had and I, I like splurge it was my birthday so i'm like okay i'm getting this big ass crab right so i got this great big uh king like red king crab and i'm gonna load up a photo you can't see it from home but or on the thing but i'm gonna share this anyway because it's i mean it's so awesome so this great big crab i had and i was pulling out chunks of crab that were probably almost probably about an inch thick maybe even more like dude it was like hot dog sized crab meat and it was just the most wonderful moment of my life uh so that was one um it was really good uh crabby bills and the second one is uh, a show that I've absolutely fallen in love with. I think it's probably better than South Park. It's better than BoJack. It's better than it's it's different in, than all these. Better than uh, Simpsons. Better than um, better than uh, 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 Family Guy. It's like a combination of if if you like any of those shows, you got to watch Bob's Burgers. That show is so well written. It's so good. Um, it's extremely entertaining. It's, 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 it's just a great show. So Bob's burgers is my second pick. So I've got Bob's burgers and I've got crap. There you go. That's me. All right. Uh, David, what are your picks? I've got one. I'm going to choose easy today. And it's, uh, in the spirit of crossover, uh, <laughs> episode. Um, but I have, I have quoted this article at least 20 times in the last three months in all the conversations it's a it's a an article written by george saunders about uh revising the work you know he's he's a he's an author um but i find that it really works well with software as well and so he's he's talking about how uh revision uh raises the um ambient intelligence of a piece and and it feels a lot like agile development it feels a lot like the clarity it feels a lot of, but like user experience but it's told in a voice that makes it feel like, oh, I can do better. Or, oh, I see now what I was trying to do with that thing that I stopped caring about three years ago. 
And so <laughs> keeping it fresh, keeping it connected, um, and, and making sure the whole system is deliverable, uh, this, this should assist you. So it's a, 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 an article written by George Saunders on, on revising our work. Awesome. I'm going to jump in here with a few picks. Um, I'm going to pick some conferences that I'm going to over the next little while, um, mainly because A, I like to connect with people and B, you know, a lot of these conferences are things that I'm really excited for. Um, the first one is next week. Um, so by the time this comes out, it's probably over. That's NGConf, which is the big Angular conference in Salt Lake City. Um, interestingly enough, if you go to devchat.tv slash YouTube, um, by the time this episode goes out, you will also probably be able to see all of the interviews I did with all the people uh, from the Angular community, like speakers and stuff. Um, I've been getting sponsorships for that. And uh, yeah, anyway, so Kendo UI is sponsoring my way uh, all the way to Salt Lake um, to go and, and do those interviews. So, um, and I say that tongue, tongue in cheek because I live a half hour from Salt Lake. Um, the other conferences I'm going to are um, in no particular order, Ruby Hack. So if you're a Rubyist, uh, I don't know if there's still tickets available. Do you know, Eric? I believe there are, yeah. Yeah, I think there are. Eric's speaking at that. I'm speaking at that. Um, it should be a ton of fun. And uh, I think they're doing it at OC Tanner again this year, So, um, which is a great venue. Uh, local company that does um, like loyalty rewards, high-end loyalty rewards stuff. Um, just, just terrific, uh, company and yeah, they're, they're hosting it at their main office. They have auditoriums and stuff. Um, and that should be terrific. That's May 3rd and 4th. I'm also going to microcop, which is a small business conference. I've gone to that every year for the past three or four years. And if you're looking at starting your own startup or anything like that, it is a tremendous opportunity to go meet people and to get a lot of input on what you're doing. Um, they have a growth edition and a starter edition. So if you're in the idea phase, you can go to the starter edition. And if you're in the, I've got something established and I want to make it bigger, then you go to the growth phase. And uh, anyway, really love that. That's the same week as Ruby Hack. It's just the first half of the week instead of the second half of the week. And then the last conference I'm going to is Microsoft Build. And that one's um, May 7th through 9th. So if you're in the Seattle area, I would love to meet you there. Um, and I know that some of our listeners are Microsoft people. so. I'm going to throw that out there. Um, the episodes that I record there will show up on JavaScript Jabber. And finally, also, as this goes out, um, I am starting a new uh, handful of shows. And just really quickly, the idea is, is they're going to be five minutes or less. They are going to cover just some topic that I find on the internet related to, and the shows are on Ruby, JavaScript, and Angular. Um, I might do one on React. I'm still toying with that. Um, and if I really wind up getting into Elixir, then I'll, I might do one on Elixir too, but yeah, I'm just going to talk for five minutes about something related to it. So I, it may be some kind of tutorial thing, or it may just be a, Hey, this happened out in the community and here's a five minute take on it. Um, but you'll also be able to get that on the Amazon echo as a flash briefing. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be playing with that. So if you're interested in that, I found the flash briefings are really kind of a fun way to get content. So, you know, then when you're shaving or whatever, you know, you can get, something funny, something news and something, you know, whatever else you're interested in. So anyway, uh, those are my picks and, uh, yeah, we don't have a guest, so I'm not going to ask, Oh, how do we find you on the internet? We'll just wrap this up and we will uh, be back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C A C H E F L Y.com to learn more.